Hey, I'm Chad Tomaszewski with TSI Today. Thanks for joining me. Uh, we're here with Dan Houston from AgriPlay, jumping into some really, really cool tech. In fact, in as many years as I've been involved in the technology business, this is some of the neatest stuff I've ever played with. Come along for the ride. Hey Dan, thanks so much for joining me today. No problem. Um, fantastic technology you get to play with. I, I was thinking of a way to try and introduce you because you're a real estate guy that has got a real love affair with technology and you found a way to combine that and make a business out of that. And, and most importantly, you've kind of done that using vacant space and, and different metropolises, Calgary here today, but but also combining that with the agribusiness, which is so unique. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got to where you are right now? So, been in real estate for uh, about 17 years, commercial side. And I just kinda have always been a nerd. And I've always been really into tech. Um, ironically, I still remember my friend and I contemplating mining Bitcoin when it was like a hundred and something dollars a Bitcoin, way back when. Um, kind of exactly what it's worth now. So, <laughs> <laughs> the little yeah. circle. Um, and I'd always been the person that always wanted to see the technical solutions kind of go the futurist on where we were going in the market. Real estate's always kind of laggard though. So after a while though, I just really wanted to jump in head first and uh, my partner was a perfect opportunity to do that. And so Adam and I jumped in and started creating a bunch of companies, Agriplay being one of them. Um, and it's been hilarious because when I left, I was really excited. Oh, so I don't, I can get put on a hoodie I can code or I can model, I can do whatever I want. And I never have to talk about commercial real estate again. And now because of AgriPlay, because of its model taking over vacant commercial buildings, I am wearing suit jackets and going in to talk to all the same people about commercial real estate again. This is a different flavor. Yeah. That's super, super interesting. So we're seeing a slow adoption of intelligent real estate or connected real estate. Yeah. Um, what do you think the laggard is in that? What, what's holding it back from that next step? Is it an understanding of the technology, do you think, at the at the highest levels within inside the, you know, the landlord space? Or, Are you talking or, smart cities? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, brick and mortar is about as laggard of an industry as you get. So you gotta understand that the guys at the top have usually climbed that real estate asset management ladder, and you make money in real estate by not taking huge chances usually. Right, it's a, it's a constant progression of building value, building value, building value. So you don't get that way by doing things from scratch. And um, one of the things that they look at, for example, like we look at data as a value proposition. They look at that, uh, they being landlords, look at data as being, in a lot of cases, um, a liability. Because if they put in a data infrastructure, or something like that into their building, but it's not the data infrastructure that the tenant wants to use, then it's completely wasted capital. Right. And then they have to put in their own that usually comes at the cost of removing what they just put in. So there's a lot of reasons to that. And that's actually one of the things, um, there's also a, a trend like we were talking about before, about looking like a thing instead of being a thing. So a lot of times those landlords that did try to push the envelope and actually do some smart cities development, smart buildings, They've taken what looks like a smart building and really it's just a two dress like a nine. So they, they put in all the infrastructure to make it look fancy, but it just, it doesn't aggregate. It, like a true smart building should actually be growing and improving its value over time by getting more insights from its recommendation engine and how it's collecting data and what value proposition it's providing back to the tenants and the landlord. And, it's, and, and they don't do that anymore because they hired too many people that looked fancy and all they were were expensive infrastructure plays that didn't really add that value. So they got burned so many times that it's very difficult to kind of push that forward. So what you need to do is lead by a positive, that's why AgriPlay existed. You, you lead with a smart building play because that's what AgriPlay's entire infrastructure is a smart cities play, right? You make that so that when you leave at the end of the term, or if you don't, you've got the technology play that obviously is the infrastructure mm -hmm. that's there that adds value and benefit. It's already there now. You don't have to worry about it. You can just inject it and move on. That's uh, that's what we need more of is a more more use case injection. I think. Yeah. So in the case of AgriPlay, um, you know I've described it really as the an agribusiness data center, and and that kind of hits on multiple different areas. If you look at the the infrastructure that was put in place uh, on on your demo site, 
mm -hmm. uh, you'd swear you're walking into a data center. Uh, it, it looks, you know, looks uh, amazing. Uh, thanks, to <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> um, it, but it was a, it was a great opportunity to to really showcase some some cool solutions inside there. However, there's a different play for this um, this data center component, and that is the data that you're actually capturing. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that data that you're you're getting, and, and what would you be using it for? Uh, so. One of the main things, so the reason that we went power over ethernet, which is what you guys helped us to put in place there, is it allows you to replace power, obviously. It allows you to replace the data infrastructure and it allows you to turn everything that you plug in now into a sensor. So you're passively collecting without a giant network of additional sensors, um, all the information about, in our case, the growing environment. So there was a gap that we saw really, there's a number of reasons that we created AgriPlay um, one of the biggest ones is that vertical farming traditionally doesn't scale uh, because it's too linked to industrial properties and uh, almost entirely linked to industrial properties. And then on the back end is one lane of output, but there's very little data on crops. So imagine that I am building a business on uh, strawberries. There's so much that I need to know in order to model what my income is going to be if I was to grow out of a container or a office building or whatever, that I need to kind of imagine what that's going to be and I have to caveat and caveat and caveat. And landlords, again, because their real estate's a laggard industry, they don't like risk. And so those business propositions mean it's really difficult to underwrite kind of what you're going to produce out of it. So what we're doing with all this data is we're collecting all the information on the light recipe, what spectrum they were using, when, nutrient value, um, you know, the genetics of what goes in, what goes, every input and every output. Uh, relative growth rates so that we can start modeling that and no matter where you grow because ultimately AgriPlay is a technology play. So we let we technology license out to multiple markets, you know, uh, in the United States right now, we're looking at Japan, we're looking at the UK, Australia is one of them, Canada, we're almost entirely covered. Every single group that's growing strawberries feeds back into our model, which allows us to figure out the most effective way to grow strawberries under the conditions and environments that we're growing, which means the system's always getting smarter. It's the smart building. Everything is yeah. getting smarter and the data is recommendation engines are getting better and better and it's easier and easier for people to produce more and more at higher value to the, to the client. So that's what we're trying to do is build, fill that gap, which honestly doesn't exist right now. It's a lot of anecdotal information about if you plant this many seeds, you get X. Really, you need to have clean data. like data science data to start working with this and not like the digital form of a clipboard basically is unfortunately a lot of groups use. That's great. I think that's also hitting another solution out there and, and as you know, try on love solutions. Yep. Um, and, uh, and that's really that 100 kilometer challenge. You know, we, we heard that about many different levels of government and you name it that are saying, hey, listen, if there's an opportunity for you to go to farmer's market and get your green peppers or your strawberries, your raspberries, blueberries, your steaks, whatever, get it from somebody that's grown it or produced it within a hundred kilometers of, of where it is. Mm -hmm. And and I think this really helps out the need in terms of produce uh, achieve that for so many. What do you think it would take in terms of square footage to feed 20% of Calgary and produce, do you think? Do you have numbers like that? Uh, yeah, so I mean, long and short, uh, I mean, this is one of those like how big is a ball string conversations. You know, there's so many different crops you can grow because we intentionally made it wide so you can fit around whatever the community needs. Um, that it's really hard to answer a question like that, but I, we've got like an average pounds of produce. Okay. We use the same that the government uses. Roughly speaking, StatsCan says that um, for, I think it was 2021, uh, the average person consumes, I think it's 252 pounds of fruits and vegetables. And so if you extend that, each one of our uh, grow modules, uh, or sorry, grow units, there's four of which in a grow module, um, produces about 653 pounds. So it changes depending on the individual demographics of where you're inputting. The 100 kilometer challenge though is more interesting is, is I think to look at it like from the general to the specific is difficult, but if you make it as flexible and generalist as possible in its installation value, mm -hmm then any of those communities can do it. So the reason that we went uh, early on and we said underutilized commercial real estate, it wasn't just because there's an obvious value benefit here in Calgary with vacancies high. It's that distressed and underutilized real estate exists everywhere. 
and every community, whether it's 3,000 square foot community center in Tok 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 or 2 million square feet in LA, it doesn't matter. If you can make it installable to that, then you go hyper local, right. which is less than the 100 kilometers. Every individual community will require different things to produce to fill the gaps that they have because COVID proved and global warming is proven right now or global change, whatever you want to call it. Um, like there's only so many more bodies that you can find in Lake Mead before California <laughs> realizes that they've got a permanent drought problem. It's not going to get better. Um, you get heavy rains like you're getting right now in the, in the rainy win uh, winter seasons and you get extended drought periods. Neither of those is beneficial to growing crops. So that long lead supply chain is kind of lost to us. So everybody needs to onshore, 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 onshore is the most important thing that we can do right now. And um, if you're lo late on silicon, that's one thing, it's annoying, but if you're late on like food, that's disastrous. Yeah, so sure. that 100 kilometer challenge, getting everybody to produce hyper-local, it also lose, lowers your distribution requirements and everything. So finding a building that is just not up to its full potential, regardless of the asset class, installing the system and then just making sure that you've got enough. But I think uh, in Calgary, um, I did this uh, once a, a while ago with CBC, I think, um, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of for 20 percent you're probably looking at six to six to eight million square feet converted um and that's uh the, i mean we're already talking to uh, groups for about four and a half million square feet over the next three so that, that won't be difficult yeah what that's a great initiative um listen i'm going to wrap it up with one last question i asked the same question to uh to all my guests and that's about uh the next generation um yeah, somehow I have become the old guy in tech mm -hmm. and, uh, and I want to know everybody's thoughts on how do we bring more young people into technology and your technology is so unique mm -hmm. and um, I, I think you're going to encourage so many new young minds whether it's farmers or whatever have you to do stuff that you're doing. Um, but what's your take on bringing new, new young talent into the technology era? I don't think it's unique to tech. I think it's unique to uh, a methodology, like a mindset, um, it, which is not mine. Um, I, uh, it was Dan Pink. Uh, he did a TED talk in 2006, really resonated with me. He talks about how um, the keys to employee engagement and removing voluntary transfer rates, which is like uh, retiring or uh, sorry, uh, quitting. I think we, we all underestimate exactly what the cost of retraining is and getting people into and finding labor. So I think there's two things. The first thing is to generalize, not specialize in your entry point. So to remove as many obstacles as you can for people to get in and determine themselves what their interest level is. The second is to make sure that you're, ma you're doing autonomy, mastery and purpose. So <clears throat> there's a way for them to control their own future. They don't have to rely on someone else. Their constant mastery is the constant getting better, smarter, learning things more. Uh, and then purposes like, they, you know, Gen Z and, and newer all want that purpose driven aspect of why they're doing what they're doing. So the tech can't just be X tech to sell more tech. It has to have a reason behind it. Purpose, yeah. Yeah, so I think if we, we celebrate on those four or those three points, that'll help open the barriers and get more people in. And I think honestly, in all industries, it's about getting more people in, seeing what they like and letting them acclimate to what they, uh, the, the skills or the interests that they have, rather than trying to force a quote of, how do I get more people to sign onto the line that's dotted and say yes. Um, those are typically not the people that you want either. Yeah, so, sure. Yeah. Dan, thanks again for joining us today. Um, if our viewers want to know how to get a hold of you, what do they do? Absolutely, they go to, uh, agriplay.com, A-G-R-I-P-L-A-Y.com. And they can uh, put all this information that you want to see on there. Yeah. Dan, thanks for making it fun. Appreciate it. No problem. Take okay. care. Bye.